Welcome to Untold Physio Stories, a podcast that informs and educates by connecting you to rehab industry leaders who share their candid successes and failures in business and practice. Welcome back to another awesome episode of Untold Physio Stories. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Ree, with the Eclectic Approach, Modern Manual Therapy, Edge Mobility System, and Updoc Media, and my co-host. Dr. Andrew Rothschild, physical therapist with the Eclectic Approach, Modern Patient Education. All right. I feel like we should just record that and not do that live over and over again, but <laughs> sometimes it's different. Also, Spear Physio on Instagram and Twitter. That's right. Right. So this was a, it's an unusual story for me. And if you guys have been following me since I started the manualtherapist.com a long time ago, and I initially came out with a tool that eventually became the edge tool, but it was the first called the Foshillator. It was called, <laughs> <laughs> did you know that? I did not know that. Right. Yeah. It was <laughs> It was called the Foshillator because back when I was very biomechanically trained and in, in that mindset, I I actually developed the tool to save my hands because my hands hurt so much from not only being a rock climber, but literally beating on my patients day after day after day. Um, I used to tell my patient, I used to tell my students that if you didn't bruise someone by the end of the week, you're not being aggressive enough. And the problem was, is that I, I got results. So it was it was called the fasciolator because I said it was a it was a it was sent back from the future to destroy your tight fascia. Oh wow! Yeah, and luckily um, Tim Flynn of Evidence in Motion, who wanted to um, start promoting it at some point, said that you know I can't in good conscience or professionally use or promote a tool called the fasciolator, so I think you should name it something else. So that's how the Edge Tool was born. And anyway, ever since then, obviously, um, and since my blog got invaded by uh, Jason Silvernail and other very evidence-based and forward-thinking PTs, you know, they really got me thinking about the mechanisms behind manual therapy and the reason why most things work. So naturally, I had either a choice to abandon everything that I had not only been practicing, but also been teaching hundreds and hundreds of PTs and and also in three fellowship programs, I realized I was probably doing it more wrong than right. And I I probably went all the, you know, the pendulum swung all the other way from me beating up and bruising people every day to being as light as I possibly could. And it absolutely worked for me on the majority of cases. And I think there are very few people that I've had to ever scrape, at least when I'm doing ISTM or tissue work, I've never had to do anything harder than what I say is uh, a happy dog licking you or an angry cat licking you, like someone said at one of my courses. So uh, this really um, otherwise healthy, maybe mid-20s softball player came in and she had uh, gotten hit with, um, I think another player slid into her hamstring. Um, So she had a decent amount of bruising at first, and that eventually kind of went away, a soreness, but otherwise she had some hamstring soreness and some hamstring weakness. After strengthening it and kind of getting it back to normal, I, you know, I was basically doing a lot of just very light ISTM. I was explaining to her that we're changing the perception of stretch. I was trying to improve her active straight leg raise, but she really didn't have any tightness. There was no scar tissue. I never really needed to do anything heavier than my super light scraping. Her range of motion overall had improved, and um, but her function had improved. She wasn't really able to get back to softball. Uh, I don't really think, uh, I think this is also before tendinopathy was such a hot topic. This may have been like maybe eight or nine years ago. Um, and uh, so I didn't really think of doing a lot of eccentric loading strategies at the time uh, because that possibly may have helped. But after about two or three weeks, you know, she's maybe 50% better in all activities except for working out and softball. So about, again, three weeks into it, 
I see her kind of discussing with my students and they're kind of like whispering. And I was like, hey, what's going on here? Like, are you guys talking about me? And uh, basically, they said they were talking about you. And it was almost like a, a an intervention. So my student was talking with the patient. He's like, you know, let, let me let me talk to Urson here. So he pulls me aside. The patient's lying on a table or maybe she's warming up on a bike or something like that. And he's like, hey, you know, I've been talking. And it's not that she doesn't believe you, but she feels like, you know, she's plateaued. And she's wondering if you could just go a little bit harder or actually a lot harder than you, you know, can. I mean, she, she really bought into the the neurophysiologic effects and she, she kind of gave it a try, but she's wondering, because she's had success in the past, can you just be very aggressive with the edge tools? So uh, I said, okay, yeah, sure. I mean, I don't really think it will work. And I also told the patient, I was like, you know, if light doesn't work, considering, you know, it takes thousands of pounds of force to form even the, 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 the most superficial layer of fascia, and that's only temporary to begin with, I don't really think this is going to work. But I I am willing to give it a try because we did do it my way. So I start off like kind of light. I progress my depth and she's like, you can go harder. You can go harder. So I'm pretty much treating it as hard as I used to, uh, probably sweating. It's a larger area, right? The whole hamstring. I'm using the largest surface area of the edge tool, like the biggest concavity. I maybe instead of doing one to two minutes of light ISTM, probably did five to 10 minutes, just like I did uh, years before, back when I used to beat on people. She was pretty sore, um, and I didn't hear for her from her for about two weeks. I think at that point we may have been following up every one or two weeks, so I didn't really know what happens. Then all of a sudden, um, she emails me, and I think she tags me or my student on Facebook. Said she went to a wedding. She's played softball since then. She's completely pain free. But two weeks later, she was still bruised. Like even at the wedding, people were asking her what was happening because it was in the summer and her leg was exposed. Her entire hamstring was black and blue, but uh, she was 100% pain-free after that. I mean, other than recovering from the the, the bruising. <laughs> oh, wow. So uh, what, what do you think? Because I have some thoughts on that, you know, but what do you think happened there? Why do you think that worked versus uh, the light touch? Uh, it probably has to do with her, you know, previous experience and, and expectations, right? I mean, some people expect that sometimes more pressure means better um and then especially with athletes sometimes they have a greater tolerance to certain types of loads and then there's that expectation of if it's not sore then it must not have done anything so i imagine it's, it, part of it is just matching their expectation of uh, outcome or what something must feel like to get something better. Yeah, for sure. I mean, my student also was a lifter. He's a pretty big dude. And I, I'm not sure if he ever really fully bought into it too. And if they had had this, if they had these discussions almost every time, <laughs> I, I wonder also how much that influenced her. Right. But I also, I also think that, um, you know, and, and the thing I took away from this was that I, you really shouldn't try to fit everyone into your beliefs because their beliefs may be different that may be affecting your outcomes. But I also think that there's a certain subset of people that I, I call uh, it having like a dull nervous system, almost like if you're the type of person who ended up being a bouncer or, you know, you hear like these people who could just like take a punch and shrug it off. It's almost like the, the threshold that's needed for them to even have the same amount of input you know, we talk about novel input in the skin, uh, light, light touch, you know, maybe these people aren't ticklish at all. Maybe they're not hypersensitive. Maybe they have like dull DTRs, you know, maybe they need quite a bit more mechanical input or, or um, stimulation of more mechanoreceptors than your average uh, hypersensitive patient or your, even your average patient. So that like, in order, I don't really know how to put it. It's almost like a, a threshold of activation needs to be met before they, their nervous system is convinced that it's okay to move again. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. No, that makes, it makes complete sense. Um, and I think it makes sense, especially for um, athletes or people who are in, who engaged maybe in contact sports to a certain degree is that they're, like you said, your nervous system has accommodated to a different um, volume or a different intensity of input. And so it's, it's sort of set point, so to speak, is, is different and it may require a little bit more like, like this person did. Right. 
Um, and, and for sure, if I had treated her, you know, several years before that, it probably would just would have been a couple of visits. But uh, unfortunately, it actually took more visits. Uh, but this was still also the only patient that I had seen since I had changed, you know, in the past eight years or so, where I actually had to go harder than I do right now. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think it's what you kind of hit the nail on the head is that it's you can't fit everybody into your paradigm, whatever that paradigm might be. It's that's part of the therapeutic alliance is kind of finding out where the patient is at and kind of coming to a common understanding and being able to adapt um, either way. Obviously, we want to keep things as evidence based and to what we know now as possible. Um, and sometimes that involves meeting someone where they're at a little bit on their side and trying to, you know, gradually bring them back maybe to your side. And sometimes it's the other way around. Like you said, if it has, if it didn't work their way, then you can, you has more, uh, rationale to say, hey, let's, let's try things my way now because you've done this. But in this case, it was, you were willing to do that because you realize maybe this will have a, she's ready. She's done it my way, but let's try a little bit her way and see if that makes a difference. Sure. All right, Andrew, where can people find you? I can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Spear underscore physio and uh, sometimes blogging at um, Modern Manual Therapy. All right. And you can find me, Dr. E, at The Eclectic Approach, Modern Manual Therapy Seminars. It's easy to check out all our sites at modmt.com slash sites. You can follow me on social media, modmt.com slash YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. So follow me on your social media platform of choice. Make sure you subscribe via email to themanualtherapist.com so you don't miss any of our awesome blog updates. You get exclusive discounts and promotions for edgemobilitysystem.com where you can find BFR, uh, Andrew, myself, and Dr. Kyle Coffey's courses and the Eclectic Approach, Modern Patient Education, Modern Strength Training, and Modern Manual Therapy. Make sure you rate Untold Physio Stories uh, five stars on iTunes. Tell everyone about our podcast. You can find us at untoldphysiostories.com. Also subscribe on Google, Facebook, or I mean, I'm sorry, Google, uh, Stitcher, Spotify, and uh, also just say, hey, okay, Google, listen to the latest Untold Stories Physio podcast and you'll get us playing. So make sure, uh, again, to tell everyone about our podcast and you have a great day.